Uh, thank you very much for the audience today for 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 joining. Um, as as the the, the subject uh, explains, we are really going to be focusing on uh, uh, many of the. Firstly, we we believe some of the mistakes that are that are happening in in, in mobile experiences today, um, and then also just you know how do we identify those mistakes? What are those mistakes? Uh, what do we learn from those? And how can we really just give you some some great insight on, on things that we can see that are trending today that are really helping us overcome some of those so that we can get a better customer experience. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, convert uh, those customers into 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 great great results for for all of us as companies. So. Uh, I'm going to introduce to uh, the panel today. Uh, we have two uh, great people in Rob and, and, and Jason. I'll let them introduce themselves. But I firstly wanted to thank you very much for, for joining us today. I think it's going to be a really good session. Um, I've seen some of the notes that you've, that you've put on, uh, on, on the presentation today. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. So why don't I just hand over to you guys to firstly introduce yourself, who you are, uh, what your company is, and also perhaps why, why uh, you're in this conversation today. Uh, Jason, why don't you start? Thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, I'm Jason Stokes, and I'm the CEO at Eastside Co. Uh, Eastside Co is a Shopify Plus partner. Uh, we focus on helping merchants move across to Shopify Plus uh, as a platform, and also supporting growth with strategic marketing strategies and on-site conversion rate optimization. Uh, hopefully, I'll be kind of providing you guys some value and, and uh, some, some tips and, and advice on acquiring customers on mobile uh, and the importance of uh, a more mobile-centric approach. Uh, in your marketing strategy. Thank you, Jason. Rob, how about you? Hi, thanks both. Um, lovely to be here. Um, so I head up strategic partnerships with Styler. Um, for those of you that don't know what we do, um, we're a content management solution. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on the, the head and the Mac trends, building a sort of detached headless CMS, which is uh, easy for users to, to, to use and build brilliant content. Um, and today I'll be talking about why mobile matters and minding the content gap between desktop and mobile devices. Thank you, Rob. And for everyone else, uh, my name is Steve. I'm the CRO for Finder Logic. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Finder Logic are a search and navigation solution. And we really are trying to figure out how to help customers uh, to get a better experience uh, while they are discovering and searching and, and figuring out what kind of products that they want to buy. Uh, providing the most relevant uh, products to them so that they have a higher chance of converting to a sale. That's really what our solution does. Um, so yeah, I'm going to hand over to, to Jason now without further ado, and he's going to lead us through acquiring customers on mobile. Over to you, Jason. Uh, thanks again, Steve. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as succinct as possible, guys. I did run over in the in the bit of the dry run, dry run I, we did earlier. So um, if I fly through some stuff. Uh, apologies, you can always ask questions uh, a little bit later if there's anything that uh, that you feel we didn't cover, uh, or I didn't cover, sorry, um, well enough. Um, so acquiring customers on mobile, um, I'm going to try and talk through um, some of the approaches that we use as an agency when it comes to uh, customer acquisition, uh, and specifically customer acquisition uh, on mobile devices, uh, and the tactics and channels that we use in order to make sure we have uh, a really effective approach um, when onboarding customers and, and bringing them to your website. Uh, so if we can just move on, Steve, slightly. Um, so one of the things that's kind of evolved and changed over recent years is the evolution from kind of mobile friendly to more mobile first and mobile centric. And this is something that we see uh, as an agency uh, all the way from kind of wireframing stage right the, right the way through to the kind of traffic acquisition stage as well. The websites that we build now, we design mobile first, we design for uh, the device that gets the most, the lion's share of the traffic uh, when it comes to you know, the, the, the customer usability portion. 92% um, you know, of the UK uh, adult population owns smartphones and people are spending a colossal amount of time on their smartphone, whether that be browsing Instagram, social media, whether that be doing research, whether that be checking emails, watching videos on YouTube, uh, you know, four, four hours, 12 minutes every day is spent on their phone and 58 times somebody checks their phone. It's a huge amount of, uh, of times that, you know, somebody is picking up their phone on a daily basis, kind of having, using that as a touch point uh, and either, like I said, scrolling through uh, social media. And also just to kind of touch upon a few other things when it comes to the evolution of smartphones, you know, and the relationship that people have with their devices as well. You know, wearables is becoming a, you know, another springboard and another way to be able to engage with 
uh, with either your existing customers or to look at customer acquisition. Um, you know, voice search, for instance, I think one in 20 searches is now done by voice. Very easy to do on your smartphone by just clicking a button. Um, an incredibly powerful way for somebody who's on the move to be able to get information, to do research, to ask Google a question. Um, so it is becoming a much more immersive experience when it comes to uh, how customers or how merchants acquire customers on mobile. Um, so moving on. Okay, so as an agency, one of the first things we like to do uh, is work with, our, uh, work with our merchants to really identify who their customers are and who they should be talking to, who they should be putting their products in front of and where their customers are ultimately, um, working out buyer personas. So the first, first thing we really like to try and, like I said, try and distill is making sure that you're putting your adverts in front of the customers that are going to be wanting to buy your products. And we're going to touch upon um, a few other kind of tactics that we deploy in a hybrid model to make sure that uh, you have maximum effectiveness when it comes to uh, the penetration and acquisition from a mobile point of view. But, you know, we go through the stages of, you know, what are you selling? Who are you selling to? And where are your customers based? If you're selling skincare, your demographic is going to be completely different to than if you're selling kind of engine parts and car accessories the places where those customers are going to be are going to be completely different. You're not going to be advertising engine parts on TikTok, but you might be advertising fast fashion. Um, so really distilling down and having a solid understanding of you know, who your customers are going to be, what they look like, what age ranges, what demographics, and where those demographics align uh, from a channel point of view. And also, I mean, this is going to be a blended approach as well when it comes to channels. There's no one channel fits all or one channel is a silver bullet. It's going to be a, a hybrid and a blend of uh, joined up strategy that says, you know, customers may start their research on this when it comes to asking questions in search, potentially doing some research, or whether that be from an awareness point of view um, in Instagram. And then that springs into, um, you know, more of a, an acquisition phase via Google uh, when it comes to brand searches. So this is the first starting point that we always like to have a kind of a really, really solid base and we suggest some, uh, suggest our merchants kind of go into, into this with some depth and have a really solid idea of uh, who they who they should be targeting. Uh, moving on, Steve. Uh, and the next one is uh, kind of the uh, uh, the right ads at the right time. Uh, so you've got top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, uh, and bottom of the funnel activities and action. Uh, and again, understanding who your customers are enables you to be able to create different adverts and messaging to be able to express your brand in a different way at different stages of the buyer funnel journey. So you've got awareness campaigns at the top of this, um, driving awareness of the brand, awareness of the range maybe uh, of products you sell. It's more emotive, it's more lifestyle. Um, you know, it's more introductory into you know, who you are and what you stand for. Uh, the middle of the funnel would potentially be building trust, educating them on the benefits of the products, the benefits of your brand, the range that you might have, or maybe even going further into specific ranges that you feel that that subset of customer might be interested in. And the bottom of the funnel would be for potentially for when that customer's identified the specific products, it could be remarketing or retargeting adverts, it could be by email communication activity, uh, but it's really highlighting the specific products that, uh, that we feel uh, are going to get customers across the line. It's, it's, the, it's the last advert those customers should really see before making that decision and clicking the add to cart button. Um, so having the hybrid of the understanding of who your customers are, where those customers should be, matched with the funnel activity and different advertisements and messaging uh, from a creative point of view, as well as a, a brand expression point of view and a, a messaging point of view, would enable you to be able to start creating a matrix of how you take those adverts uh, to the actual uh, channels themselves. So moving on, Steve. Perfect. Uh, so social commerce. Social commerce is effectively um, advertising and generating uh, traffic and sales through social media. Um, I'm going to touch upon a couple of different tactics quickly underneath this, uh, which we deploy for our, our customers in order to gain traffic uh, and specifically across mobile devices more prevalently now. Uh, so moving on, Steve, slightly. Um, so meet your customers where they are. Uh, after you've identified who your customers are, you've worked out the different types of messaging and adverts that you want to display for the, uh, the, uh, where the customers are in their buying process and in, in that uh, top of the funnel versus bottom of the funnel um, process, you'll be able to work out which channels uh, are gonna be relevant for the customers that you're trying to target uh, and at what stages. 
So 28% of UK users use social media to research brands. I know I've done this when it comes to adverts I've either seen uh, on Instagram uh, or on Facebook. I might then go and look at their organic social, for instance, or do a Google search and see what their reviews look like. Maybe have a look at some user-generated content to understand what other people are saying about them on social media, uh, creating a picture of you know, who the brand is that I might be buying from. And that's more, again, more, more, more and more relevant for companies that are selling considered purchases versus impulse buys. Um, uh, you can reach 36% of the global, po uh, the global population over the age of 13 through Facebook ads, the global population. That's a huge, that's billions of people that using social media via Facebook, Facebook ads, Facebook ads manager, which also encapsulates Instagram. So the reach is, you know, is huge across, uh, across region, you know, internationally to be able to get in front of customers from a, uh, an acquisition point of view. Uh, 53 million people in the UK are reachable via YouTube ads. Now, YouTube, again, is something that tons of people don't tend to do. We see kind of people focusing on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, like there's pre-roll ads you can do to people that visit your site once uh, well, once they've kind of left um, using Google Ads Manager. Um, but also Gymshark used to leverage uh, YouTube and YouTube influencers massively when it first started as a growth hack. People within that fitness industry we're building professional videos, we're building how-to videos. You know, there are tons and tons of ways for you guys to be able to get in front of uh, the audiences that you've defined with these mediums, whether that be influencer, whether that be paid, whether that be a hybrid model. Um, so moving on quickly to a few of these specific tactics themselves. So paid social media ads. As we mentioned, there's top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, bottom of the funnel kind of activity. Top of the funnel would be awareness campaign ads based on segmentation. So once you've worked your demographic out, Facebook's targeting and segmentation uh, and audience building is incredibly powerful. You'll be able to go in there, put in gender, age, interest based metrics to be able to build out um, segments of people to target with the creative and the messaging that you've come up with uh, based on the demographics that you've identified. So to be able to laser focus, put this, these uh, these adverts in front of people to build brand awareness, uh, drive people to the website. Uh, once you've built enough data from who's clicking, who's purchasing, you'll be able to build lookalike audiences. So audiences that look like people that have bought from us in the past, which again is incredibly powerful when it comes to bottom of the funnel, middle to bottom of the funnel activity. When we know that customers look like somebody who's already bought, Facebook will do all the hard work for you guys when it comes to being able to put the adverts that are relevant to them in front of them at the right time um, for them across not only Facebook, but also Instagram, Instagram Reels, which is also another uh, advertising medium that's, that's coming up. Um, and following on from this, there's two other channels that are under, we feel underused a little bit, TikTok uh, and Pinterest when it comes to uh, research or a younger demographic. Uh, also an incredibly powerful way. It's not as competitive as Facebook. Uh, so you tend to find the lower cost per acquisition on there as well. Uh, so two channels which I'd also explore uh, under a paid social ad perspective. Uh, moving on, uh, influencer marketing. So as we mentioned, uh, Gymshark have used this from a growth hacking point of view, as well as quite a few other really, um, really influential disruptive brands that have grown and scaled incredibly, incredibly quickly over the last four or five years have all used this as part of their kind of marketing toolkit, as it were, to really generate a maximize audience uh, and awareness uh, for their, their business. And feeding into this with the buyer persona data, you've worked out who your buyer, you know, your, your buyer personas are, you've worked out who your customers, your ideal customers could or should be. You'll be able to put into quite a few tools out there and distill down the types of influencers that you could be or should be engaging with that have the audience of customers that you want to be targeting. So you'll be able to use clever tools uh, to really do some research and make sure that you're supporting and collaborating and onboarding the ambassadors that you really want to work with that are going to get your product in front of the customer base that you're really targeting. Uh, and again, great for band building, but also great for product reviews, getting influencers to get your actual physical products in front of the right people. Uh, moving on, Steve. Uh, organic and community building. So this is probably one of the largest amounts of time that you'll ever invest. It's an owned piece of uh, your own business when it comes to um, the content that you put on there, but it builds massive amounts of trust. For you guys to be able to 
own this side of, of your business when it comes to the voice that you build, the community that you build, or the customers that you have. If I'm a new buyer, I'd potentially look at the credibility that the company has when it comes to their own social media. How frequently do they, do they post? What do they post? Um, and do they engage with the customers that, that have commented and posted, uh, posted on uh, some, of their, uh, you know, some of their content that they're producing? Um, like I said, from a community point of view, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and it's part of that toolkit that really helps kind of compound the results uh, when you put that into the mix as well. Um, so moving on, I'm gonna to quickly touch upon SEO uh, and search from a mobile point of view, which uh, seems to be um, kind of, as I mentioned earlier, um, progressing into things like voice. So moving on, um, SEO and mobile has kind of changed or Google has kind of changed its position, position um, recently when it comes to how it uh, views websites. Uh, it does this by mobile first indexing, it monitors site speed and also behavioral based metrics. So in other words, it rewards your website if it performs incredibly well from a speed perspective, the buyer or the purchaser, sorry, the, the user that's uh, visitor that's, that's browsing the website will also have a much better experience on the website, which Google monitors and rewards that behavioral based metric, again, from a conversion rate, time engagement and engagement point of view. And the content that you use on that mobile mobile site itself needs to be mobile first. Just shrinking down kind of a website from a, uh, a desktop to a, a mobile device perspective is no longer uh, the go-to way to maximize the rankings that you've got in Google. And SEO is still incredibly important when it comes to intent-based searches. So having customers that are looking for your product or looking for the, a problem or looking to solve a problem, sorry, uh, or doing research, this, is ten this tends to be where their journey is gonna be starting. Um, so it's still an incredibly important tactic uh, to, to generate customers, to generate acquisition and to generate, uh, to generate revenue and, and traffic. Um, so moving on, uh, key takeaways. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a kind of a compounded effect from a hybrid approach, but build out those buyer personas, really distill down who your customers are, overlay that with the different types of the funnel uh, steps that you're gonna have in the messaging that you will be and how you'll be communicating with those customers. Optimize your website for speed and behavior. Make sure that you've got a really, really performance site. That Google understands that uh, your customers are engaging well with it and your customers are getting a good experience. So there's a frictionless path, path to purchase. And last point, analyze, refine, repeat, scale. Um, yeah, fail fast, learn quick, sanity check what's working, what isn't, uh, and, and optimize on an ongoing iterative basis. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. Jason, thank you so much. Uh, that's super valuable information. Um, uh, great insights, you know, really uh, it's super appreciated. So thank you. I hope the audience has uh, taken some notes. Um, I definitely have, uh, and I definitely will be speaking to some of the, some of my customers about uh, things that you've just mentioned today. So thank you so much, Jason. That's really appreciated. Um, uh, so if we just go on to ours, uh, I just wanted to uh, moving on to our session. So this is my part of the session. Uh, where we're talking about reliving the, the burden of product discoveries on mobile devices. And I, I want to just say that I, I'm focusing today on the end customer's experience and the challenges that they face with mobile UX. Um, and, and this really, uh, it's such a small screen, so it actually limits their opportunity and potential, uh, which if not done correctly, can lead to lower conversion rates ultimately. Uh, and I think companies, you know, like, like Fundalogic, uh, but many other companies, what they're trying to help uh, companies to do or retailers to do is to really just simplify and enrich and improve the, 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 the experience uh, to make it more comfortable for customers to actually use uh, their actual websites uh, on, on the mobile. So, you know, before we go into, into a lot of detail, I wanted to just share some statistics with you that will maybe help uh, give you some more information around this topic. Uh, and the first one, like Jason said, you know, um, mobile shoppers that are 20 times, they're, they're, they're doing 20 times more shopping than they used to do on a desktop. Uh, and this lines up with Jason's uh, uh, comment around the fact that actually we're spending uh, more than four hours uh, a day on the mobile, uh, just messing around, uh, using it for many different reasons, some for work, some for personal, some to take photos, but you're using your, your mobile phone much more, uh, which means that it's, it's part and parcel of the focus of, of, of your hands um, on a daily basis. 
And this, of course, is a trend. Uh, and there's two things that are that are, are the key and uh, that are key here. One is that we're moving more away from desktop to mobile. Um, but the other one is, which is really important, is uh, the mobile is becoming such a conflict of a, cu a customer's or a consumer's uh, interest uh, because there are so many things that can get in the way. It's fiddly. It's uh, there's there's a small screen. There's too many elements to think about. Um, where on the desktop it's a bigger screen, so you're able to be able to take in more. Whereas on a mobile, you have to be really specific about how you actually guide that that customer to a potential end journey. Uh, and I think that what we're trying to do as a mobile centric approach here, uh, really all all companies today are trying to really just simplify that process so that um, that mobile UX can be better for a customer to be able to operate in. Uh, if you look at the the seventy percent, I'm moving to the other one. You know, seventy percent of our top retailers. Uh, everyone knows who they are. Uh, they're actually delivering a poor mobile experience. And the reason for that is they're, they're making the mistake to be able to take desktop and mobile UX as one strategy. They're, they're making the, the desktop and the mobile the same. Uh, and we believe that it's really, really important to make it a different experience. It's a different channel. Uh, so why don't we, why don't we treat it the same? Now, you know, uh, we, we should be measuring it uh, as a standalone channel, we should be measuring its success as a standalone channel. Uh, we should have a, a strategy only for mobile, um, because as you can see, the trend is moving towards the mobile, uh, the mobile UX. Um, and I think what is really important here is that customers get frustrated because we have the so-called seamless journey. But actually, it's not a seamless journey. It's cumbersome and it's fiddly. <laughs> and uh, particularly when customers are actually discovering, researching, and trying to find relevant products for that they want to buy, um, it's even more important because there's a lot of detail that you're wanting to be able to create on a in one space, and uh, it can become quite quite overwhelming. Uh, and then the last one here, uh, really, I think is is important is we can potentially even move that conversation. Uh, to uh, get better insights. What I think retailers should be doing is gathering the data. How do they actually search? How do they move from one place to the next? And then use that information to be able to get a better experience. Uh, the last point here, the 80% of customers equate uh, the, uh, a company's UX to actually the brand reputation. Uh, and this is very important uh, because actually what you're wanting to do is to make sure that as a customer, you want them to come back but if they have a really bad experience, they end up believing that that's the brand reputation that you hold because of the fact that you're not moving with the times. So actually they go to someone else and then your brand reputation suffers. So it's very important for you to think about that because that, that could actually impact not just your, your, your brand reputation, but again, uh, the, the, the bottom line. And actually I'm seeing some of the, the statistics from the following, if you just look at these these next numbers here, we're saying 63% of the mobile users abandon a product on a website if they have an issue, right? So that's a huge number. If we are having specific issues and complexities and how we actually guiding them through a process, they will move on. And then 88% of online shoppers actually won't even come back to your website. <laughs> how important is that? Do you really want to have that amount of bounce rate um, if you're not focusing on a mobile strategy? Um, and the last one is really important. This $100 um, investment, obviously every dollar you make, you gain, you gain $100 back. That's what your goal is. Um, but what I find is that we're spending a lot of marketing dollar on sometimes the things that are things that we need to create as an infrastructure to be able to support maybe more traffic or more, more people coming to our websites. And what we forget is possibly looking at the things that are actually important for us to be able to convert, which would be a, a better mobile UX. So maybe we should try and focus on spending the, right, uh, the dollar in the right areas to be able to get the, the right experiences and convert the right results. Um, if we're looking at some of these things uh, for us, you know, this is just us in our in our specific industry. We're uh, we're a search and navigation uh, solution, and we have experience in trying to figure this out from a mobile UX perspective. Um, and we, you know, we believe that uh, you should focus on three uh, three areas or three pillars, uh, and that is how do you uh, how do you make the search of a mobile experience when they're searching for for, for products easy, understandable, and simplistic. And then when they're navigating, uh, how do they navigate through all of the different types or maybe categories 
or maybe different options to be able to get to the, the to the product that they find that is the most relevant for them. And then also, how do they move from that specific end result to exploring other things on your website in a very simplistic and easy way so that their experience is really good. So those are the three pillars we try and focus on, uh, especially in, in, you know, in our vertical and search and navigation. Uh, and, uh, you know, one, uh, there's a couple of points that I think we can really learn from. One is you, it's a limited screen, so you have to stream on the process. Uh, you, you can use overlays to be able to make that more simplistic uh, rather than create an, an integrated into like a desktop approach. You can create overlays on a mobile approach uh, to be able to make it more uh, streamlined and, and, and easy to uh, easy to navigate. Uh, there's off canvas canvas filters. We call them sticky filters in Finder Logic, um, but it's uh, it's off canvas filters, which allows you to be able to still get to the filters at any point. Which again, once people are searching and they may not think that the search was right, let them get back to uh, to that off canvas filter so that they can actually. Uh, uh, alter their, their, their search criteria to be able to get to the right results. Use AI. Uh, everyone talks about AI. There's a tech, everyone has a foundational technology around AI. Uh, how do we enrich the actual experience from the customer to be able to get the, the, the right results? And then the last one is your voice functionality. Um, it's becoming more of a topic. Uh, we need to start using it. Uh, we have many different things like Alexa that are, are, are playing into this game. Um, search terms on Google, for instance, are becoming much more voice centric. So let's also use that specific functionality in, in the way we deliver a great experience on our mobile devices. Uh, one of the things that I just wanted to highlight here, this is this, <coughs> this actual, uh, these, these images are from Pomo. Um, shout out to Gareth, who is the e-commerce manager at Pomo, who, has driven this and uh, luckily they're a great customer of ours as well. Um, but I would love to just uh, highlight that, you know, they're, they're a great example of how they're using mobile UX to be able to uh, improve the, the experience. And three things that are important, they've limited, uh, they have limited screen space, so they've maximized that. Uh, they've kept a lot of the mobile overlays very simple as you've seen in the, in the three images over there. And the last thing they've included voice search, which again has really helped them with the results. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, moving on. Um, now, I wanted to, you know, in this thing, just give you two examples. Uh, one is where I think we can potentially, uh, a company that could potentially improve um, the UX experience on the mobile and one that's doing it really well. Now, firstly, I want to shout out for the perfume shop, who we're going to say is a, is, a, uh, is a company that could potentially improve their mobile. They're doing very well in many areas. That's why they exist today and they're doing a great job. Um, uh, but if I look at some of the examples that I have available to me, I can see that they could potentially improve their UX experience um, on the mobile. And if you look at some of the, the key things that we've said here today, uh, the keyboard is covering some of the recommendations. Uh, it looks very cluttered. Um, and sometimes it's just, uh, it looks like it's replicating the desktop uh, environment and the, 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 the desktop UX. Uh, again, really quick fixes uh, to be able to try and get, get uh, the experience on the mobile better. Uh, if we look at a good example, this is Tamara Kamoli, who is a, a jewelry uh, site online. Um, you can see that their lines are clean. Uh, they're covering as much of the screen space as possible. Uh, they're using voice in their search uh, and actually something that you can't see on this image, but they're using first click interaction. So as soon as uh, you click on the actual search bar, immediately this overlay starts to appear. And as you start typing, different things start to happen um, as you go, which again, it starts to get the user through the, through the experience to be able to get them to the right result. Um, one of the things that I think I want to point out here is you can see in both of these examples, we one has an image-led approach, the other one doesn't. Now, you may think that image, images are good, and yes, in some mobile experiences, they can be if you do it properly. But in a search and navigation-led uh, experience, we believe that actually image-led experiences can often clutter and complicate the process. So that's why if you look at the Tamara Kamali example, it actually hasn't got any images because we're trying to filter to the right results. And when we get to the right results, then we'll display the right images and also the details in those images. Uh, another topic which is really important is how do we replicate the the social experiences uh, that we that most consumers are used to into your mobile UX. Uh, Jason very uh, rightly said, you know, social media is a huge way and an opportunity to be able to acquire new customers. But also, 
most customers today are using these social media platforms. And I think that if you're creating the opportunity to be able to make it similar to a mobile, uh, to, to a social media UX, you'll have the comfort of that, which is similar, which means that the customers themselves aren't trying to figure out how to navigate themselves on the mobile because they're already used to that US experience, the UX experience. And so we believe that you should try and create very similar approaches to the way that you are delivering your UX on the mobile. Uh, and also, you know, just making sure that it's as seamless as possible, trying to figure it out. You'll create many different types of things that could be lead to better, uh, to better results. Uh, what, I, what I mean by that is you have low bounce rates, I believe, because it's more comfortable. Um, they're used to that experience, so they get to the right result really quicker, which again leads to better conversion rates. And also the experience is the same, so they don't feel like the reputation is different. So we talked about the brand reputation element. Uh, if it's very common and the same, then it means that the, 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 the actual uh, displays across different channels are seamless. <clears throat> Sorry, just getting my thing. So the next thing that I think we wanted to, to highlight is just this AI thing. I know that that is something that is, is, uh, is a huge topic and common in every area. Um, but I wanted to say that I think you can utilize that in the right way. Uh, if you look at some of the examples that Pumo have on these on these uh, on these images here, you can see that actually they're using uh, the ability to be able to create an algorithm to be able to get to the right result. Um, so they're using it in their actual way of searching for consumers or customers to search to get to the right product. Uh, so they're doing it in the UX and mobile as well, but also they're gathering data behind the scenes so that those results or those displays to be able to get them to the right results are optimized uh, to be able to get to that result quicker. Uh, and I believe that we can find ways to do that in a better way if you are using this type of technology to be able to get better improvements, more enhanced uh, ways of, of searching that, that criteria. Um, so yeah, so I think, you know, uh, we've got some great results. Uh, you, you, uh, the increase rate is by 216%, but also people tend to buy 21% um, more products on average. Uh, so I think it's just it, it, trying to figure out how to use that in a better way so that you can uh, increase the experience. Uh, I wanted to quickly give you uh, another quick example on some overlays, uh, just to give you some further uh, in examples of improvements. We have here again, chain uh, reaction cycle, great brand, doing very well, um, but you can see that they are clearly not using uh, a different strategy on mobile. It's very similar to the way that they're doing by desktop and mobile. And, and you can see that it looks uh, complex, it looks overwhelming, uh, it's not optimized. Where if you look at Humanic, uh, which is a customer of ours, you can see that the filtering way is very, very simplistic. And you can see that actually there's a lot that they can do, the easy to access to, to, to relevant information. Uh, again, it's just giving you two or three good examples of, of what we can do differently to be able to optimize that experience. Uh, one of the last things that I wanted to just uh, talk about is this ever-present filters. Now, we call it sticky filters. You can call it ever-present filters. Um, if you do to, uh, end up talking to us, we'll actually have sticky filters as a, as a feature, <laughs> um, but it's called sticky filters, so apologies for that. But what we're actually talking about is the ability to be able to just change up your search results and enabling a, a customer to be able to get to that um, to that opportunity as quickly as possible. As we know, it's a journey. It's not just search, but it's also exploring. So if there is a way for them to be able to change up their criteria to be able to get to their results, we need to provide them the ability to do that as quick as possible. And so that's why we talk about having these sticky filters or these ever present filters as a, an off canvas opportunity so that even though that they're scrolling you've still got those filters at the top of the of the of your of your mobile ux which gives them easy access to be able to filter those results uh, so i've given you some you know useful uh useful information that we believe that we are seeing some of our customers do that will that have improved the us experience and the mobile experience um, i hope you found that really useful i'll leave you with the last thing over here which is to say uh, at the end of the day, in our in our experience, um, if the shopper can't find the product, they won't buy the product. <laughs> Simple as that, right? So let's find a way to be able to make them get to that point as quickly and as sim and simply as possible. And I think that if you are enhancing your experience on on the mobile, 
you know, we can def we are seeing some of these great results that you that we're seeing on the screen today, uh, and customers are really improving the way that they are. Uh, they're using they're using uh, mobile UX to enhance their customers' experience and then lead to better conversions. Thank you very much for uh, for listening. Uh, I'll, leave, uh, I'll I'll hand over to Rob. Thank you very much, Steve, um, and thank you, Jason. Um, I think we can both say tough acts to follow there. Um, today, I will be speaking about minding the gap between uh, desktop and mobile commerce. I'm going to talk about the challenges and the hurdles of the mobile content journey. So here we're specifically talking about capturing customers on mobile, showing them relevant content, and then getting them to a purchase. Um, onto the next slide, please. So I think the first thing we need to establish is does mobile matter most? And before I sort of get waylaid with the content element of this presentation, I just wanted to highlight a few things. So with great on-site content, you start with a plan and then you execute, but it's all too easy to focus on form, things being particularly high resolution or particularly you know, engaging for customers. But when you come to mobile, there are many, many blunders that you can sort of accidentally stumble into um, as you're trying to build a mobile strategy. And it all comes down to how you address it. Ultimately, mobile should never be seen as the lesser channel of a mobile or a content strategy. Um, and I'm gonna talk about why it matters. And um, let's just sort of start with these facts. So more than 50% of all online traffic will be sourced from mobile phones. And as Jason specified earlier, that could be through social, that could be through ECG, that could be through influencer marketing. It's a massive, massive funnel approach. It's, it's providing a huge amount of traffic to your mobiles, my mobile streams. Mobile commerce sales have increased by 40% on a global sale since 2017. And I want us to hold that in mind because we're going to come back to it right at the end of this presentation. However, there are some issues. We've got massive amounts of traffic, huge amounts of compelling, uh, motivated buyers. But there's an issue here because when they get to site, things go wrong. 18% of small enterprises and micro businesses currently have a mobile friendly website and 51% of consumers will still gravitate back to desktop um, purchasing because they find using a mobile device too difficult. So increased traffic, more and more mobile browsers coming down the funnel, less and less of them are able to transact on mobile. Now, I wanted to include a, one of my favorite sites, especially from my DIY campaign in the last few months. Great on desktop, not so great on mobile. And I'm gonna come onto that as to why in a minute. Onto the next, please. So. Let's just take a step back and talk about where retail came from and try and understand if, how those steps that we've taken over the last 15 years translate all the way down onto our mobile devices. We used to go shopping. There used to be one stream. There used to be one place. And in those environments, they were beautiful. They were well polished. Everything was nicely laid out. All of the experience from buying, from moving into the shop, walking past it on a cold day, the things that made us go inside were all down to the content, how it was laid out, how it looked, how it felt. As we've moved forward, and it's all thanks to these things, things have changed. And I think it's, it's very easy to highlight how in-store content is very different to mobile content. Of course it is. But what we need to try and understand is as users, we expect that level of quality to be emulated through all digital channels. And it's evident from studying many, many of these websites that digital investment is typically lower than in-store investment ever was. And as a buyer, a customer, or a browser, we will always spot the weakest part of this quality experience. Now let's talk about more about what that actually means. So as a buyer, a customer, or a browser, we're gonna be far more critical when it comes to a mobile. And I think the, the aim of this hour uh, from Jason's brilliant metric earlier is to stop all of you looking at your phones on an average of 3.3 times through this hour. And I'm hoping that we can keep to that. However, few brands focus on this unified content strategy on the device we use most. And I wanted to pull up a particularly worrying metric that exposes this point. 22 seconds is the average mobile load time uh, as served by Google, uh, Google <clears throat> sorry, and Ipsos earlier this year, um, 22 seconds. This hasn't changed. This figure was forecast in 2017 and it has not changed. I don't think many people here would wait 22 seconds for a coffee in a queue, let alone for a mobile site to load. Next slide, please. 
Um, <clears throat> so didn't we lose something on the way from these brilliant in-store experiences that some of us remember from our childhood and some are even still present to see today? You know, think of the espresso um, layout in Selfridges. It's really, really good to look at. Or a Molten Brown shop. Every time I look past, I see this beautiful content experience. But what brands have done is they've taken it, they've digitized it, and then it's been dropped onto mobile. Now, that just simply isn't going to work in 2021 when attention spans are dropping, user sessions are going down on mobile, and more and more users are using it. Think about the difference, therefore, from going from a fantastic app, think of Bonobos, or um, potentially even the little app, where it was the highest rated app on the App Store for 2021 with 60,000 downloads in a week. Um, Think of it going from there to a mobile site. How many of your favorite brands and retailers are emulating this brilliant app experience or this brilliant desktop experience onto mobile? And as Jason pointed out, with the Google Core Web Vitals updates this year, there are massive penalties in your SEO, massive de-rankings of organic search results. Google are starting to punish brands who are not investing in digital strategies. So I think we have lost something along the way here. And the amount of people, the quality of that traffic, the quality of a mobile browser shouldn't be underestimated. And we need to do more to optimize this process. So one little final figure before we move on to some facts on, on page load speeds. 30% of smartphone users are more likely to use a company or brand's mobile site when browsing or shopping for a one-time purchase. That means they're not repeat customers. Now, this figure could be skewed to be positive or negative, but I think it's overtly negative. Only 30% of people will use your website for the first time. If the website's poor, they're not coming back. And we need to up that figure to make sure that mobile engagement is far, far better. Because if we can capture that one-off purchaser with a brilliant content and brand experience, we're more than likely to be able to bring them back to site through retargeting, as Jason pointed out. Uh, moving on to the next slide. So we've talked about content. We've talked about how things were in the past. But let's talk about how things are in the present. A really worrying metric that I did some research on is, uh, and these are widely available studies based on, on page speed and how we can optimize for mobile. If you load your page in one to three seconds or between one to three seconds, your bounce rate will increase a small amount by 30%. However, if you were to go from one to six seconds, you're looking at a bounce rate increase of 106%. And that's huge. That's doubling the amount of users who will never see the content. You can make a brilliant brand, a brilliant content. You could work with an incredible agency. You could work with incredible search providers, building a really, really well thought out and structured end-to-end -end user experience, or to lose them because your mobile site speed is too poor. So think about that for a second. We're all going to look like the lady on the bottom left of this slide. We're frustrated. We've invested in our tech. We've invested in our content. We've invested in our agency, and we've built some fantastic pages, but people are not spending time on them because they're loading too slowly. So I've been the harbinger of doom and despair so far. Now let's talk about how I can help. How can we solve these problems and optimize mobile better? Um, next slide, please. So there are some simple and effective steps. It's not all doom and gloom. Typically within your existing tech stack, there are things you can do to optimize and improve your page load speeds. Now, the content could be there. It could be great. It could be awful, but ultimately you can't test and optimize that content if you don't have traffic and you don't have time on site. So ask your agency or recruit a brilliant digital agency. Um, of course, we can think of a couple. Work with them, ask them questions, see what stacks they're recommending. Are you using the right things, the right tools, the right third-party tech? Are my pages badly laid out? Do I need to, you know, could I lazy load this image? Does this, this particular YouTube or Vimeo video in, in HD need to load on refresh or render? Always ask why, what can I be doing and how can I help? Evaluate your content. Do a spring clean of any legacy tags. If you've started using Finder Logic, get that legacy tag off your HTML pages. Don't let them be cluttered. I wouldn't suggest doing it in the run up to peak, but of course, get that HTML and additional JavaScript off your pages. It will improve your page speed scores and improve your Google rankings as a result. So evaluate your content, but also explore headless options. There are so many options available on the marketplace now. There are so many interesting and incredible ways to break away from reliance on a monolithic back office, loading your front end or loading your CMS. Look at these options, explore where the headless fits your business and then build a plan to make that work. So 
All roads point to a decoupled lightning front, lightning fast, headless front end. Sorry, that's a mouthful. But how can we actually execute this? And what other strategies are in place if that's too much of a long-term goal for my business? Moving on. So you could try a PWA. We've talked a lot about how apps and social traffic can drive really, really incredible engagement for our brands. But typically, if you're not ready to move your site forward and invest in a headless structure, it might be that you could bridge the gap using a PWA. Essentially, a progressive web app sits to offer mobile users a downloadable and cannibal retail experience. Now, whilst it might work offline, if you're between tube stops, you're not able to transact, at least you're giving mobile options. You're giving mobile browsers a really, really good platform where they can engage with your brand, they can view products, they can even be educated, they can use search tools. All of this offers mobile browsers an insurance policy versus a poor desktop responsive layout move to a, to a mobile. So it reduces the risk and uncertainty of brand content by being specifically made for mobile and you can download it onto your phone or your computer and have it ready whenever you go. One I would recommend checking out would be Bonobos. Um, it's an absolutely fantastic example of a downloadable, shoppable, and even has some personalization built into it. Um, and I would thoroughly recommend checking it out as a best use case. Um, I should also point out as a shameless plug, uh, we have obviously these out of the box and ready with our new front end product. Next slide, please. So I thought rather than me waffling on for a full 15 minutes, I would consult someone far more experienced and far more wise than I. Um, so thanks friends for, for giving me some time last week on Slack to talk through what are our top quality tips from Styler for on-site content. So I asked if there was one content blunder you would eradicate from the face of the planet, what would it be and why is that? Franz responded, content primarily built for search engines. Now, whilst we understand that SEO is incredibly important, users are smart, users are canny, and users are very intelligent. If they can see that you've built a landing page purely to capture more traffic into it, but there's no education, there are no tools to help you find the products you need, there is no uh, direct link between the social channels or the source areas that brought you to that page and the actual content that you arrive at, it looks really poor, it's not a good execution of your brand strategy, and it can devalue the brand. So please avoid it at all costs. And then I asked, where do you see the most opportunity for clients to make quick wins? Now, all wins are great, but let's be honest, coming up to quick, uh, to peak, I thought quick wins would be more relevant for the room here. So I'm afraid it does come back to a more generic answer, but I think it really, really plays well with what Jason and Steve discussed as well. Investing in your brand strategy will always yield more whether that be your content, your social channels, your ways of acquisition, or once you've got customers to your site, they love the content, they engage with the brand, and then they think, yeah, I'm going to look for this product. I'm going to find this thing. That's what you need to invest in, whether it be time, resources, or finances. You want to invest capital in your tech stack. You want to ask your agency for advice and work with your third-party vendors to make sure that you're always optimizing, always changing. And as Jason said, continue to iterate this all the way through. Um, moving on. So let's try and summarize 15 minutes of waffle into three key points. And I'll come back to that square, the quote that I promised we would talk about, which was smartphones will generate 221.2 billion in mobile commerce sales by the end of 2021. Um, this was a forecast from 2017. Of course, they couldn't forecast the years that we've just had, uh, and I won't mention them, but I think really interestingly, we've seen a 60% year on year growth and the figures for 2021 had already been achieved. Absolutely staggering. And I think we can all agree that mobile commerce is not going anywhere. So the move to mobile is here. It's irreversible and it's valuable. We need to adapt the same principles of an in-store layout and apply them to every single uh, channel and customer route to our brand or retail site. Customers will find the weak links and we need to make sure that the content, the UX, and of course, the, the methods of acquisition are consistent throughout all of those touch points. It's not enough just to copy and paste anymore. Retailers are too savvy and there's far too much competition. But don't panic because tools do exist to optimize and scale content and your site quality and load, load speeds across your devices. Don't omit the mobile browser importance from your channel strategy or tablet for that matter, because in some cases, in some businesses, we've seen rises in tablet versus mobile and mobile versus tablet. So be aware of every single breakpoint that you can think of. 
and make it part of your universal strategy to adopt and fix these changes. Don't dwell on them as mobile, uh, desktop, social. Amalgamate everything together because then your content will flow far, far better through these three distinct areas. And continually evaluate the methods. What is going to be the next new channel? Is it an app? Is it going to be an evolution of digital? Uh, you know, could it be social linked? We don't know the answers and they're going to be different for every single business. But one of the main benefits that you can capture right now is to optimize your site speed, optimize your on-site UX, and some of the methods and the tools that you can use are closer than you think. Thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Steve for the questions. Well, Rob, thank you. That's super valuable insights. Um, thank you. Uh, a lot of the data is also great to see visually. So, um, you know, it's really great not only to speak through it, but, uh, you know, you gave us a great journey right there. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to just uh, try uh, hand over to the audience now um, for Rob and Jason, just so <coughs> we could maybe just get some of the questions, if you don't mind. So I'm going to just stop sharing my screen. Uh, and then I'm going to look at the QA box here. Um, right, so we've got a couple of questions here that I think we can uh, we can potentially hand over to you guys. How, how much benefit could you see a site in changing to a headless CMS in terms of load times? Like, you know, how much quicker is it actually? So I'll, I'll hand over to both Rob and Jason to see what that what what's your thoughts on that. Do you want me to shoot for the hip on this one, Jason, and then let you follow up? Does that sound right? Um, cool. I mean, I'm going to say uh, that depends on what you put on the page. But I mean, it's a lot quicker, but if, if you've got a lot on the page, there's still a lot going on. It, you know, it's all relative, really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've, we've done some research into this. It, it obviously depends on, on how you configure your pages. Um, but typically for mobile, you're going to see the best increases. And, and some of the sites we've launched recently, you're seeing between four to five seconds saving. Um, and that can be in terms of the Lighthouse scores, increases of 20 to 30 points out of 100. Uh, it's not a percentage, but it's a points out of 100 systems. So yeah, as, as Jason said, it depends on the third party tags that you add and the content that you load. But typically, you would see a four to six seconds saving in your page load times through a headless option. But again, that's just, it's subjective. Great. Um, then um, as a small business, medium-sized business, uh, just on this uh, moving to headless infrastructure, uh, do the benefits really outweigh the time and resource it takes to change? Uh, just your thoughts on that, guys. It's a question I get asked a lot. Yeah, I mean, of course, it does depend on, on the size of your site and, and the way that you can do that. If you're a single domain site, single language, and obviously all of your traffic is coming through one, um, it can be a large time invest. It can be a large uh, scale project. That said, if you've got subdomains, you can do it in phased approach, which is often a really, really good way to use your lower traffic areas and then obviously see the salt, the, see the in, insights and see the, the changes you get. Um, but it really depends on how you go about it. You know, um, Shopify, and for instance, and some other headless vendors offer a really, really seamless transition period. If you, a lot of them are actually already geared up to be headless. You just need to then adapt and add a front end or a CMS product. I think it's a case of phased changes, trying it out on a smaller domain or a smaller site, maybe a sub a sub page, um, and seeing if it works for your business. But um, a lot of the brands and retailers that we work with that are making the changes uh, have too many mobile customers to avoid making those changes. So it does depend on the mobile to desktop versions of customers that you have and the breakdown of your traffic. Um, but typically, we can evaluate that as on a case by case basis with them. Great. Um, Jason, here's one for you. What is the best Shopify theme for fashion footwear for mobile users? How, how do you mean best? Do you mean best from a customer experience point of view, best from a cost-effective point of view, best from a brand expression point of view? I, how, I, I guess the first question would be, how do you define best? Um, if it's from a customer experience point of view, I, I would always suggest putting the customer first. Um, you would need to look at other brands within your ecosystem and brands within your vertical that are doing this incredibly well. I, who, who are the market leaders within footwear? You know, what are they doing? How are they servicing the customer? What do their websites look like? Um, you know, what features and functionality from other, you know, best in class market leaders out there? And then uh, do some do some due diligence once you've done some research on the themes in the theme store and kind of publicly available themes uh, and try and align yourself with, um, you know, with kind of, um, 
yeah, well, which one looks closer to uh, you know to the research you've done? That would be the, the approach that I would take if you're going to go with a an out of the box theme. Um, Great, thank you. Um, I got one here on the chat, um, which is to say, how do we envision live stream shopping impacting e-commerce in 2022? Um, it says yeah, Clarence has just secured a mega contract internationally. What should startup brands invest in? Is it too early to adopt right now? Yeah, I guess this from a, like a live stream home shopping kind of perspective, um, you know, you had these shopping channels, it, you know, it, it's all used to be about where people used to spend their time. You know, people used to spend a lot more time watching TV rather than watching Netflix, watching kind of more on-demand based content. You know, it, you've now got the fact that people are, again, like you've got Twitch, you've got, you know, other forms of, of you know, content people are digesting. Um, it makes it more on-demand rather than going and flicking on a channel, which you still can do and is still very effective. But, um, you know, and it all depends on where people are starting their buying journey, their research phase um, and getting in front of customers. Cool. And for me, uh, this is the last question for me, just so that, uh, you know, we get a little bit of round robin going here. Um, what do we think of voice commerce? Um, it doesn't seem to have much uptake in Amir. Do you think this will change? Um, uh, in my opinion, you know, voice voice search is becoming is a huge thing already in the us we've seen some statistics on that side um and there uh, we can see that actually i think one of the numbers is like 40 percent of any search right now is actually uh, going towards a voice type of uh search so the actual search terms are becoming a lot more complex they're becoming a lot more conversational a lot more human uh and so uh, that means that we have to adapt to that environment. Now, that's just statistics from the US. We can get data from there, but I do believe it's actually coming here in Europe. Uh, I do believe that we do need to start thinking about how to optimize for those results. Um, people are becoming more familiar. The landscape of, of different um, uh, different uh, um, continents are becoming quicker. So, you know, even though the US used to be quite advanced before everything else happens, I think the the gap between what's happening there and what's happening here is becoming less. Um, so I do believe that it's going to be quite a quite a big feature and and uh, an opportunity for us uh, in the near future. Uh, that's all we have time for. Uh, thank you, uh, the audience, for asking those crazy questions. They're lovely. They're brilliant. Um, sorry for the confusion. We've had chats. We've had Q and A. We've had some other questions come in um, from behind the scenes as well. So. Um, thank you so much uh, again, Jason and Rob. You've been fantastic uh, uh, today. Hopefully everyone's learned something new. Um, but yeah, have a great day, everyone. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Rob. And thanks, Rob, and thanks, Steve, for hosting. Cheers. Bye-bye. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye.